So novel ecosystems occur uh, at all scales and in terrestrial, freshwater, estuarine, and marine environments. Most of the work has been done in terrestrial systems so far. So novel ecosystems can also be created in addition to species invasions or introductions, loss of native species. Uh, they can be created by land use changes caused by people and global processes like climate change and chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans. Um, novel ecosystems can occur when agricultural fields are abandoned and you can end up with, oops, wrong button, um, can go to novel and whether they'll stay novel or be some kind of a hybrid mix forever isn't quite known. Um, they also may possibly return to historical conditions if they haven't been too disturbed uh, or if people are involved in restoration. There's new thinking about novel ecosystems. It's a young field. It didn't exist more than 20 years ago. And it was a collection of papers and journals and hard to pull all the pieces together. But in 2013, a book was published about novel ecosystems based on a workshop held in Australia. And what was added to the definition of novel ecosystems, besides they're different from historic ecosystems, and they include social components. In other words, people, their values, uh, funding, land ownership, et cetera, and the concept of thresholds, that there may be a threshold beyond which an altered ecosystem can never be returned back where it came from. So to identify a novel ecosystem first, you ask the question, is it altered because of people? If it's quote unquote natural succession, that's different than human actions, human degradation of the environment. If it's not altered due to people, then you have a historic system. If it was altered by people, then you need to know, are the changes caused by people reversible? If they are, are reversible, you may be able to have a hybrid ecosystem, which with time and restoration might possibly go back to a historic system. If you have passed a threshold where you cannot return, you're stuck in the novel ecosystem mode and you've got, you can't get through that barrier. The, hi whoops. the hybrid system also, without intervention, may go to a novel ecosystem. So examples of the ecosystem alteration and degradation that can create these novel ecosystems, as we mentioned, ag abandoned lands, pollution, nitrogen fertilization, overharvesting, and dispersal barriers or fragmentation so species can't move around, uh, invasive species introductions, loss of natives, forest pests and pathogens. They're kind of a subcategory of invasive species. And there's almost no mention in the literature of forest pests and pathogens as a cause of creation of novel ecosystems. But clearly, they could do that. Also, predator removal, which leads to excessive deer browse, which we heard about from Tom Rowinski this morning. It's a very poorly recognized cause, but an important one. We've got novel ecosystems created by deer browse across an awful lot of the landscape in the eastern United States and global change, climate change, acidification. So I have to put in a picture about deer browse to follow up on Tom a little bit. This is a wading river, Derek Rogers' photo. Um, and that denuded understory is because of deer. And deer browse can lead to resurgence of non-native species, like Japanese barberry at Mishoma Preserve. A few examples, upper left, we'll talk about some more later. That's a successional old field, uh, Suffolk County Parks. Uh, upper right, uh, oops, Japanese Barberry in Bear Mountain, New York. Middle left, a Hards Lake Dam. It's in a freshwater impoundment. It's pretty novel. It's no longer a flowing stream and everything has changed. Fish assemblages can change, middle right. 
Laura left as a California grassland. They don't even know what native species were there originally because the weeds got there before the people did. And the lower right is the Peconic River with Phragmites and Cabamba. So Earl Ellis at the University of Maryland has defined novel ecosystems as unused lands embedded within settlements, croplands, rangelands, and semi-natural anthromes, as he calls them. And they cover about 37% of the ice-free terrestrial globe. Uh, and the rest of the areas used are semi-natural, maybe 75% or less. <clears throat> Ellis has put together a time series of maps showing wildlands, semi-natural lands, and used lands beginning 1700. The um, used land, whoops, I keep pushing the wrong button, here we go. The used lands are these, croplands, villages, range lands, debt settlements, semi-natural woodlands, and wildlands. Novel ecosystems would be the bits of leftover land embedded in this matrix of semi-natural or used lands. By 1800, wild has shrunk, semi-natural is growing. By 1900, wilds shrunk even more. Used lands are really starting to increase in coverage. By 2000, wild lands are down to maybe 10% or 15%. Um, and the rest is used and semi-natural. You may have heard the term age of the Anthropocene. It's considered a, um, it's a geologic term, and you ought to be able to find in deposited sediments with time some marker to show that we've reached the Anthropocene, maybe layers of plastic. Have to ask the future scientists about that, but humans have had a significant global impact on the Earth's ecosystem. And in the past where we might have viewed the biosphere as natural with humans uh, disturbing them, human settlements embedded in the nature, the natural ecosystems, anthropogenic biomes is the other side of the story. You've got mostly human altered lands with the remnant natural areas scattered within. This can be kind of depressing, but it is the direction we're heading if we're not there already. Emma Maris is a, a writer, a freelance writer, very good, very smart, not a scientist. Um, she has made some of the more extreme contrarian kind of statements, but uh, she was claiming that maybe even these uh, novel ecosystems might even rival their pristine counterparts. There she is. So how good are these novel ecosystems for nature, for wildlife, for anything? Are they, is it a hopeful situation or just overhyped that they have this value? Are they weed patches or valuable functional habitats? As Mar Emma says, do they rival pristine counterparts? I kind of doubt it, but we'll continue with the story here and we'll see. And do they produce ecosystem services for people? So ecosystem processes and functions include flows of energy and materials and functions involved with interactions of species with each other and with processes. So examples are photosynthesis, primary production, carbon storage, cycling of nutrients, cycling of carbon or organic matter, say in the soil, maintaining soil fertility, decomposition also cycles carbon, maintains soil fertility, uptake of water by plants is involved in water regime regulations. And ecosystem services are simply processes and functions that benefit people. And that can include your provisioning or food production, clean water and air, pollination, soil fertility, regulation like climate stability, 
flood control, disease control, and cultural. Natural areas are very important for human health, not just physical, but also mental, psychological sense of well-being, recreation, and aesthetics. And services can include supporting factors like, again, primary productivity, which leads to food production, supporting food webs and wildlife, soil formation, etc. I hardly need to I, I define biodiversity for this audience, but it's the complete, complete number and variety of species, diversity of the genetics, not just the species, habitats and ecosystems, the diversity of the ecosystems in an area, a biome, or the planet, and the diversity of ecosystem functions. Without ecosystem function, sound functions and uh, resilience, you're not going to have the ecosystem services that people need. So high biodiversity is good. And the more species you have and functional groups you have that are capable of different kinds of responses to change, the better off you are when disturbances strike because you have some redundancy. Several species that might do the same job under different conditions. So oscillations are damped down and the ecosystem has greater resilience and adaptability to disturbance. And it's often called the insurance effect. However, field tests at the scale of food webs and ecosystems are few for obvious reasons. It's pretty hard to do a full ecosystem study of everything. So I'm going to talk now about the effect in particular of invasive plant species on biodiversity and implications for novel ecosystems. Studies that have been done show that as alien plants increase, we have decreases in the abundance of native plant and animal species. The diversity of native plant and animal species also decreases. Animal growth and fitness decreases. Animal behavior can change and decomposition may decrease and the soil may become more acidic. As um, in alien, alien plants increase, we ha may have increases in total primary production or plant production, often due to one really dominant invader that can grow very aggressively and produce more biomass. And these uh, results come from a variety of meta-analyses that look at dozens to hundreds of studies lumped together. So ecosystem functions are also affected. With more invasive non-native plants, you have decreases in decomposition, light availability, acidity of soil, as previously mentioned, and you may get increases in nitrogen and phosphorus cycling, microbial activity, and carbon pools in the soil. What does this do to food webs? Plants are at the center of the food web. The plants are eaten by insects. Insects are very important in converting relatively no nutrient, low nutrient plant material into fats and proteins, nutritious packages to feed wildlife, such as the birds, Coyotes and house cats, frogs, mice, raccoons. 25% of a fox's diet is insects. Deer are up there too. Some, uh, Tom mentioned that there is uh, some videos showing deer eating eggs in a nest, a bird, a bird nest. And uh, insect fats and proteins are good for people too. That's the real paleo diet. Most insect species, even those that are called generalists, can eat relatively few plant species. And many of you may have heard Ptolemy talk or re read his book, Bringing Nature Home. This chart, this uh, table comes from his book. And it's a list of the different chemicals that plants produce and um, different species of plants produce. And individual insects have evolved to tolerate 
one specific compound. A couple of examples are, is the luna moth larvae. They prefer sweet gum and hardly grow on other native species, a little bit on some native trees like black walnut or persimmon. But if you feed it non-native species, all the larvae died in the experiment except some very poor little stunted uh, caterpillars on horealism. And everyone knows about monarch butterflies and the native milkweed. Non-native plants therefore reduce the diversity and biomass of native insects. Ptolemy has studied butterflies and moths, Lepidoptera in particular, and he and his students have found that if you um, survey the plants, collect the insects, and calculate the average number of native Lepidopteran species that can rear larvae on a particular plant genus, these are the results you get. Woody ornamentals, introduced, you're down maybe 5% of the Lepidopteran species, oops, could survive on the um, introduced woodies, but on native woody ornamental plants, it's a huge difference. Plants that are not woody, or all plants together, introduced, not very many Lepidoptera can rear larvae, and more on the native plants. There's not a lot of other studies looking at different insect groups, but some are underway, and Ptolemy says that similar results should be expected for other groups of insects. This is one, one of the very few studies that looked at some other group. She did her work in the Azores and looked at uh, insects that eat seeds, and you don't need to understand the details of this diagram, but the point is um, when you had mostly native plants, the area that's black shows you there were a, there's a lot of diversity and abundance of, of parasitoids and herbivores in those seeds. When you have 50% alien seeds, 50% native, a big reduction in the abundance and diversity of insects. When you're down to 99% alien seeds, almost nothing. So the author estimated that if native forests are replaced by non-native vegetation, you will lose about 67% of insect biomass in the seed predation food webs. And whoops, the impact of non-native plants is one of the least studied areas of invasion biology. And the bug splat indicator, if you're 40 or over, you probably remember that a uh, lot more wind sh insects hit the windshield when we were younger. And according to Ptolemy, we risk losing 90% of our insect herbivores as we lose native plants. So native species and ecotypes, even if they're not extinct, they may be so few that they're functionally extinct. So we may be losing genetic material we need for evolution. You can't evolve if you're extinct. There is some evidence of short-term adaptations to invasion, but if you look at the big picture, I don't think evolution is going to be the solution very soon. The number of herbivorous species supported, say, by Phragmites australis in its homeland is 170 in places where it was introduced, only five. Similar results for the other species. So I want to come back to the Anthropocene just for a bit because there's controversy about this idea of the Anthropocene and about novel ecosystems, which are part of what happens as the uh, landscape becomes anthropogenic. There are some writers who are pushing for uh, a different approach to conservation somewhat. We need and want to keep the native reserves and, and protected areas, but they're going to be a fairly small percent of the total landscape, and we're not really preserving much more. We're reaching a limit on what's left to save. So they're thinking we really do need to support biodiversity or uh, species and diverse habitat types 
in and among human landscapes. So novel ecosystems fit in there. There's also controversy about novel ecosystems. Simberloff and others had an article in Encia.com recently claiming novel ecosystems provide a license to trash nature if they provide ecosystem services. Because, you know, the, private, the previous authors and others make a point that we need to include people, we need to have um, resources for people as well and try to work with nature at the same time. And they, Simberloff and the others uh, are horrified that the thought biodiversity conservation may be replaced by conservation that looks at human needs and e economics. There was a rebuttal by one of the authors in the Hobbes et al. book that just says they're being very short-sighted, just condemning the idea out of hand because the degradation caused by people is so huge, we've got to be pragmatic and got to work with novel ecosystems and do it carefully. And the novel ecosystems approach doesn't mean we're stepping onto a slippery slope in our commitment to conservation and restoration. One of the authors of the book in her chapter um, says that when there is evidence, we've moved out of reach of the past. You can't go back to historic ecosystems. Novel ecosystems management offers possibilities for thoughtfully choosing alternative management goals and priorities. Well, how will we know when to restore or when we have a novel ecosystem to uh, work with? And how do we choose these alternative management goals and priorities? Well, um, with apologies to Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, the enlightened conservationist's prayer, higher power, you pick one, grant me the serenity to accept the novelty I cannot change, the funding to restore the ecosystems that I can, and a flow diagram to know the difference. <laughs> There's the flow diagram. <laughs> this is from Hobbes' book, uh, chapter 18, Halvey. Um, if you start at the top here, you've got to know, oh, the little red, oh, there it is. You have to know your ecosystem, assess it, know it well. What are your goals? Will you have a problem reaching those goals? If no problem, wonderful, you have a historical system which you can maintain as is or restore, or it'll do it by itself. If you do have problems, if things have changed in ways you, that are harming the ecosystem function and your, your goals, can these changes be reversed? Yes or maybe, you have a hybrid system of mixed uh, novelty elements and native elements can the barriers be removed or altered to go back to a novel, to go to a, um, to a historic? If they can, maybe investigate removing the barriers. Manage as a hybrid system if you can remove some of those barriers. And if you can't remove the barriers, you're into a novel ecosystem from which there is no return. Whoops, all right, we'll get that later. Um, <laughs> all right, that's what we want. So if the changes are not reversal, you're reversible, you're immediately in a novel ecosystem situation. You've crossed the threshold. And so you've got to think about, well, what can your management goals be? Even with novel ecosystems, you have choices. You can pr still protect species and biodiversity, recover, maintain function and services, or manage for novel species, composition, function, and services. It depends on how, far, how much your system is altered and how reversible the changes are. You also have to ask, is the cost and risk acceptable? Theoretically, you may be able to restore, but if you do not have the money, um, you gotta think about something else. Change your scope, change your scale. If it is acceptable, go ahead. 
And don't forget the monitoring. That's not included in this diagram, but it's cru crucially important, important for measuring your success at reaching your goals. So I guess for the conservationist's prayer, this is the Enlightened Conservationist Bible. It's that Hobbes book that I talked about before. And if you can't afford the $70 Bible, you can get the Cliff Notes version, just published the end of last year in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment, and you can have your very own copy of the wonderful uh, flow diagram. So a quick example near to home, near to my home, I live about a mile from here. This is the Wicks Farm, Froelich Farms County Park. It uh, was an old potato field in 1951. Now it's a mix of invasive and uh, scattered native species, and I'm gonna run through these fast because there's a lot of different invaders here. I guess you get the picture. There are still native species, but you have to search to find them. So here's a site where you may have to manage for ecosystem services. One service is organic gardeners are growing produce there, giving it to the food banks. And gee, the skiing was pretty great there in February. So food webs, wildlife, we, we know nothing about that side of Wicks Farm or other places like it. We need more research. So what do we do? We can't just focus on our little areas, little patches like Wicks. We have to look at the whole landscape matrix. Human areas, developed or not, um, settlements, natural areas, novel areas. And about half of invasive plants were introduced from horticulture. This is one of Talamy's picture of his neighbor's house. Um, every single plant there is non-native. And his view about these novel ecosystems, that as we've discussed, food webs are greatly altered and simplified and degraded with low species diversity. So you're getting functional homogenation, and it can be on a pretty widespread scale, considering the amount of acreage of landscapes and lawns. And he claims many native plant genotypes can survive in cities. You have to pick species that come from environments with similar uh, habitats to cities, like a cliff-dwelling plant might do well next to a sidewalk. So use native plants, fight degradation. Manage that matrix at all scales, from backyard habitats, you can shrink your lawn, more native plants, maybe leaf, leaf litter in place for insects. Reduce all those causes of degradation we've talked about, including deer browse. You can work uh, areas within developments to keep them more natural, natural species, green infrastructure, and sell only non-invasive plant species and cultivars. So the DEC's final invasive plant regulations are out and in force, uh, and there's lists of species that are prohibited from sale and those that are now regulated. So kind of the bottom line in a way, novel and hybrid ecosystems do have value, and we need them because an awful lot of the land is developed and, and more and more is being developed. But we do have to be aware of their possible limitations and deficiencies, food webs in particular, uh, and uh, do the best we can to try to maintain biodiversity in the whole suite of lands from purely natural through novel. And maybe a little bit of hope from Emma Maris that even though the world is anthropogenic, it isn't hell. At least she doesn't think so. And I agree with her that we have a duty as a species to protect and manage the earth with love and intelligence. So protect and restore the natural and historic while we have to accept and manage the novel for nature and for people. We have time for some questions. Any questions? Good heavens, was I that thorough? <laughs> Maybe I've scared you off, I don't know. Yeah, Marilyn, um, 
I know you, you did a lot of work when you were at the Nature Conservancy with our um, grasslands, I believe, and uh, I was wondering how that fits into this, uh, particularly like the Montauk area. Are there any ways that we can uh, maintain those? Is, is fire still a consideration, or how are we going to go about that? Well, that's up to the landowners. It's county parkland as far as Montauk is concerned. Right. But um, grasslands are filled with invasives, and they're not easy to remove. So I think Polly Wiegand will be talking tomorrow about grasslands and invasion. Another question? Can you hang on? Is anybody developing any sort of protocols for when you accept Phragmites and when you try to remove them? It's kind of, I mean, you've, you've kind of got it outlined in such general ways, but how do you know? Well, you have to start digging into the specifics there. I know Bern Blossie has done a lot of research with Phragmites, um, and there is a um, invasive plant decision tool available through imapinvasives.org, where you can, for a given infestation of a particular weed species, go through the, the questions and follow a flow diagram to get to whether your strategy should be eradication, uh, suppression, et cetera. Thank you very much.